Okay, so um, welcome everyone to today's uh, IAMP One World uh, Mathematical Physics Seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker, Anton Alexeyev from the University of Geneva. And the title of today's presentation is uh, Virasoro Hamiltonian Spaces. So Anton, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, thanks a lot for this invitation and for an opportunity to speak here. So um, the title of the talk may be a little bit cryptic, the rhetoric Hamiltonian spaces. And in fact, uh, as you will see, this will be uh, mathematics, which is uh, motivated by some recent progress uh, in theoretical physics. So let me give you a plan of what I will be speaking about. So there will be two uh, motivation parts. And one of them that's uh, a little bit about recent works in, in Jakif Tanborn gravity. So that's one of the uh, possible two dimensional gravity theories. So I will show you some things about it, but I must say I'm not a great expert in it. So I will present you the aspects that I'm a little bit familiar about and which motivate our study. And there will be another motivation that's the piece of mass, a very beautiful and classical piece of mass, which is a Hamiltonian geometry. So geometry of Hamiltonian actions of groups. And uh, based on that, we'll be uh, talking about Hamiltonian actions, one can say of the Verasori algebra, or, or maybe better to say of the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle. So uh, there will be two types of examples. One of them uh, is a Classical examples, which were studied already for a long time, so-called Virasora quadjoint orbits. I will show you a glimpse of classification. And then uh, there are new examples, basically uh, the new part of, of the story, that's this part four, uh, moduli of hyperbolic matrix on surfaces with boundary, and that's motivated by Jakif titled Born Gravity. In fact, Jakif titled Born Gravity, you will see it, people argue exhibit some 2D, 1D duality phenomena. And uh, duality, that's a physics word. Uh, I don't know, in mass, the corresponding word is probably equivalence or equality or isomorphism. So we'll see some uh, actual or maybe conjectural isomorphism between 2D and 1D objects. And then I will end up with some open questions and conjectures, which will be related to those 2D, 1D duarities, and a little bit to infinite dimensional dystermat hackman integrals to infinite dimensional localization. So that's the plan of this story. And then uh, I understand it's probably a little bit off uh, with respect to the usual stuff happening at this seminar. So please don't hesitate to stop me at any point and uh, ask questions or make comments. So, uh, so with that, maybe we jump into the motivation part one, if you don't mind. So uh, recently, uh, there was a lot of works on uh, Jakif titled Born Gravity. This wave still continues in physics to some extent. Maybe uh, the paper that I would like to refer to is some uh, uh, important paper by Saad Schenker in Stanford. And okay, the setup of the Jakif title born gravity is as follows. So we're dealing with two dimensional field theory. So here uh, there is a drawing. So this is the surface sigma. This drawing will repeat in different contexts during the talk many times and we'll be always considering surfaces with boundary. To simplify things, I uh, make a drawing with one boundary component, but in principle, one can imagine many boundary components. That's not essential. So this is a Lagrangian field theory. And since it's a theory of gravity, one of the fields is the Riemannian metric on that surface, so G. And in Jakif titled Born Gravity, there is also a scalar field, the so-called dilaton. And the Lagrangian, the bulk part of the Lagrangian of that theory is a product of the scalar field times the curvature plus the cosmological constant. In general, uh, instead of this one, there would be cosmological constant lambda, but we, put, we set it equal to one. For us, it's important that it's positive. 
And then there are some boundary terms which are important for the discussion, but uh, I will not be talking about them. Now you will see some consequences of those boundary terms on the next slide. So uh, obviously, if you consider the Earl Lagrange equation with respect to the dilaton, you will see that the curvature of the metric is minus one. And this means that G is actually a hyperbolic metric uh, on sigma. So that's, that's why this story is linked to hyperbolic geometry. And this will be very essential for us later on. Now, uh, one of the claims, so in the paper of uh, Saad Schenker and Stanford, they advance many things, but one of the important claims is that there is a duality between this, uh, or equivalence between this 2D model and a 1D theory that I present on the next slide. So this 2D, 1D duality, and uh, I would like to make an example. Let's take a surface to be uh, very, very easy, just a disk. So a genus zero surface with one boundary component. So uh, then the claim is that the JT gravity is dual or equivalent to the so-called Schwarzian theory. Now on S1, you can think of the circle as a boundary. So one of the physics ideas that I'm not sure if we know how to exactly make sense of is the following. Uh, they are saying that because of the boundary terms, you can interpret this theory as a theory of this Wigley boundary. So the disk that we have don't quite feel the Poincaré disk, but it's very close somewhere to the infinity of the Poincaré disk. And then there is uh, this boundary mode. So the boundary oscillates and that's what we observe. Okay, I, I don't make a judgment on how correct, on how pertinent it is, but uh, we'll see, we'll give our own interpretation of this phenomenon. So the claim is that the Jekyll Teitelbohm theory on the disk is equivalent to the following interesting Lagrangian theory on S1. So now I write for you another action principle. So S depends on the function F and uh, it is, uh, it has a kinetic term. So this is the kinetic term, one half F prime squared. So something that we would expect in a Sigma model. And then there is another interesting term. So this uh, beautiful or curly S of F and this S of F is a so-called Schwartz and derivative. Probably most of you, or maybe all of you have seen this Schwartz and derivative, if not, that's an interesting quantity. We'll come back to it again later on and I will show you some properties. So this is the third derivative of F divided by F prime minus interestingly three half F double prime over F prime squared. Now uh, this field F of X, it's a diffeomorphism of the circle. So namely it's a quasi periodic function with positive derivative. So F prime here is positive. So there is this uh, constraint and f of x plus two pi is f of x plus two pi. So this is a kind of interesting and mysterious statement. This 2D theory supposedly is equivalent to a 1D theory with some kind of strange action functional and which depends on a complicated object, the diffeomorphism of the circle. And uh, so that's our first motivation. You will see why it rings the bell. Uh, and why uh, we are talking about uh, Hamiltonian geometry. So our interpretation of this phenomenon is Hamiltonian geometry, and I'll try to convince you why. But before, I probably need to tell you a little bit about classical Hamiltonian geometry. So that's what I'm going to do on the next couple of slides. So our second motivation is Hamiltonian geometry. So what is it? So that's some uh, very beautiful, very powerful classical mathematical story, which was developed mainly in the end of 70s and the 80s. So, uh, and the context is as follows. So we fix a Lie group, typically in, in standard examples, this is a compact connected Lie group. And this uh, beautiful or curly G is its uh, Lie algebra. And uh, the objects that we consider are as follows. So G acts on a manifold equipped with a two form. 
So here A stands for the space of differential forms on M. And there is a function mu uh, with values in the dual of the Lie algebra. So there are three objects, a G action, a two form, and a function with values in the dual of the Lie algebra. And this is called the Hamiltonian G space. If M omega is symplectic, just to recall, this means that D omega is zero and omega is non-degenerate. So then uh, the, main, the main condition is this moment map equation. It says that the, that the fundamental vector fields of the G action are Hamiltonian vector fields for the function uh, mu uh, pairing with X. So mu pairing with X is a real valued function on the manifold. And this is just the Hamiltonian equation, which is written here. And then the third condition, sometimes people add it, but let me, let me add it because we want some maximally good or maximally powerful definition. So the moment map is equivalent uh, under the group action on the manifold and the coadjoint action on the dual of the Lie algebra, right? So here there is, uh, there is a natural representation of the group, the so-called coadjoint representation, and we want equivariance under that action. So you see there are three objects and there are three def three requirements. So this is uh, kind of, this is rather restrictive. There are many things, but then uh, there are several huge and absolutely amazing consequences of that definition. Just to remind you about that, uh, maybe the most used ones in the literature. This is the Marsden Weinstein reduction. So if you take uh, a preimage of a point uh, under the moment map and then divide by the coadjoint stabilizer, you obtain a new space. It may be a manifold or this space may have some singularities and this space is uh, symplectic. So this is, this is a way of obtaining many interesting and complicated symplectic spaces from relatively simple ones. For instance, all uh, toric manifolds, they are obtained just by reduction of vector spaces. So um, then there is a convexity statement. You take the image of the moment map and you divide it by the quadrant action. You need to convince yourself that actually this uh, gadget is uh, nat naturally sits in some affine space. But once you do it, it turns out uh, that this image is convex and polyhedral. If your manifold is compact, it will be uh, a convex uh, uh, a convex polytop, but otherwise it would be a convex polyhedral cone. Now, uh, the next amazing thing, and maybe convexity theorems, I should say, this is uh, Atiyah, Gilman, Sternberg, and then Kirwan in the most advanced formulation. And then localization, so you can consider integrals. The simplest ones would be an integral over M uh, with the Liouville measure of the exponential function of the moment map. And then it turns out that there is a sort of localization formula which tells you that uh, the left-hand side can, can be computed as a finite sum of uh, fixed points of the maximal torus action. So this guy T is a maximal torus of some localization contributions. I don't want to bother you with writing those contributions just to tell you that this is an exact uh, sort of exact stationary phase or exact steepest descent formulas. Finally, there is a big chapter, a uh, big consequence called quantization commutes with reduction or Gilman-Sternberg principle. And um, so this is about uh, geometric quantization of those symplectic manifolds. And perhaps I would not dive into it, it would deserve a separate lecture. So all those things, they were developed um, as I said, in the end of 70s, in the 80s, maybe quantization commutes with reduction was proved by Mindrankin in the end of uh, 90s. But, uh, uh, but that, that's some kind of classical, very interesting and very powerful stuff. Of course, uh, when people saw that, uh, that this is a very good definition, 
And there is also a lot of stories about how to generalize it in different directions. One uh, obvious question, can you make it work for some infinite dimensional examples? And uh, one of the theories or the theory that I would like to highlight on the next slide, this is one of the attempts to do it. And here uh, you take one of the tame infinite dimensional groups, that's the center extension of the loop group. So you take your favorite compact connected Lie group G, you consider the space of loops, so the maps from S1 to G, and it possesses a canonical center extension called LG hat. So you can ask a question, what about Hamiltonian actions of this gadget? How does it work? Well, of course, you would say now this LG hat should be acting on a manifold M. Uh, probably this manifold needs to be infinite dimensional, so some Banach manifold uh, with uh, a two form, which is uh, symplectic, so uh, closed and in some way non degenerate. Here, there would be also like analytic questions what do you mean by non degenerate? And with a moment map, interestingly, uh, the natural target of the moment map is a so called smooth dual of the uh, loop algebra. And this is the space of one forms on the circle with values in the Lie algebra. So that's a sort of uh, somewhat non-trivial step. Uh, that's a choice of Mind Rankin and Woodward made about 25 years ago. So they said, okay, let's study this infinite dimensional example. Uh, over the last 25 years, uh, people studied basically all the aspects, all those four big consequences, and you know, they all work. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's highly non-trivial. Uh, some research on that still continues, but I would say the main statements, they were established over the last 25 years. So surprisingly, it all works, including like localization and quantization commutes with reduction. Notice that for instance, for localization, you, you should say what kind of integrals is it, right? Is it some pass integrals or is it what? And we do have some very convincing and interesting answers to all those questions by now. Uh, I, we, we won't dive into it because today we, we're gonna do another example, but just one thing to say. So one of the motivating, one of the big examples that Mind Rankin and Woodward were considering were the spaces of flat connections. And here we are back to the surface sigma so we consider a surface sigma, and we consider the following space. We consider connections on a trivial G bundle of a sigma. So these are one forms with values in the Lie algebra G. We impose the flatness condition. So in particular, you may think of some phase space of a chern simons theory. That's where we usually find such things in physics. And we divide by the gauge group action. The important thing, so that's this step. We only allow gauge transformations, which are one at the boundary. So this will be naturally an infinite dimensional symplectic space. It has an action of the loop group and the moment map, right? The map to uh, uh, one forms, these values uh, uh, in G on the circle, this is just a restriction of the connection to the boundary, right? That, that's a very, very natural map. And it turns out that this is one of the basic examples of the minor and Woodward theory. So we'll see that, uh, we'll, we'll see parallels to that in the story that we want to develop. So now I gave you all my motivation. So there is this development, in JT gravity, where people are thinking about hyperbolic metrics on surfaces with boundary. And there is a classical, by now classical theory for Hamiltonian actions of loop groups, which is very well developed and where all the Hamiltonian package is established. Now, uh, you know, if you want to do some infinite dimensional uh, story, uh, where you want to uh, try some tame infinite dimensional groups, there are basically two main candidates. These are loop groups, and these are this is the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle. So today we're going to look at this second example. 
Yeah, I was actually recently asking Woodward why they didn't look at it to start this. And yeah, he gave me some some reasons for that. But but in any event, probably they could have could have started doing it uh, 25 years ago, but it has not been done. So it's also a nice, a nice niche that one can fill. All right, let me recall, we have this group, uh, orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of the circle. It also has a canonical center extension by the group S1. You probably know to define the central extension, uh, you need to give a two cos cycle. Uh, so the, the function of two group elements, and this is a famous bot verasoro cos cycle that one uses here. So if you have two diffeomorphisms, you can uh, construct a functional of those two diffeomorphisms, which looks like this. And it defines for you a canonical center extension. You see, it's given by some kind of relatively nice and simple formula. Maybe just, just to say that this guy is also d over dx log g prime of x. So the cos cycle is not completely symmetric in f and g, but it still looks somewhat symmetric. So uh, log f prime times the derivative of log g prime. So uh, maybe one small thing to make it more precise. So the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle is not simply connected. It contracts to the circle, which is given by rigid rotations. So it's somewhat more convenient to look at the universal cover of diffeomorphisms. And then uh, you can pull back the uh, central extension to this, uh, uh, to this universal cover. So that's why we have this whatever curly G, this will be our group. That's the central extension of the universal cover. And the universal cover, that's something that we already seen in the Schwarzen action. These are those uh, quasi-periodic maps of the real line to itself with positive derivative. So uh, now we need a, a little bit to know, like to set up the Hamiltonian theory, we need, for instance, the uh, dual of the Lie algebra. We need to know what is the coadjoint action. So let me tell you some things about it. So first of all, uh, right, the Lie algebra will be the Lie algebra of diffeomorphisms, which is vector fields on the circle. So this, uh, this curly X stands for vector fields. And there will be this uh, R, which is the Lie algebra of S1, right? That's uh, this central S1 that I have in mind. Now, the dual to it would be as follows. So what is the dual to vector fields, right? So vector fields are gadgets of this form. And the, the dual to them would be quadratic differentials. Because if you have uh, T of x dx squared, you divide by 1 dx, 1 dx remains, and uh, there is a natural pairing, which is an integral v of x, t of x dx. So that's, that's the natural pairing between quadratic differential and vector fields. There would be, of course, also the dual to the, uh, to, to the real line, right? So there is duality here in the duality here. And uh, the element of this dual real line, the real number is usually called, denoted by C. And in conformal field theory, this is called central charge of the Verasoro algebra. So it's actually advantageous to put uh, the quadratic differential and this number together in one object, right? And this object, is a, a second order differential operator on the circle. So there is the C which multiplies the second derivative plus the potential given by T of X. In fact, uh, I gave uh, a similar talk last week and there people in the audience asked me, okay, you say it's called Hill operators and uh, who is Hill and why, well, what kind of operators? Why, why should we use that name? And to my shame, I didn't know the answer. But then other people in the audience, they did know the answer. And now I am happy to bring this answer to your attention. 
In fact, uh, it fits very well to the mathematical physics synonym because Hill was uh, a mathematical physicist in the end of 19th century. And what he studied was the motion of the moon under the influence of the sun. And that's, that's how he came up with, uh, with the Hill equation. So that, that's why in part of the mathematics tradition, it is called the Hill's equation. Of course, we can also say the Schrodinger equation on the circle, or maybe the sturm liouville equation. That's really up to us what kind of name we use. But I don't know why historically in part of the literature, the reference is the Hill's equation. And uh, here I'm citing the corresponding paper of 1886, which is kind of nice. So I, I must thank pe people who explained to me it last week. So um, now maybe closer to our topic, uh, one remark, uh, and this will be important for us. Hill operators are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, projective structures on the circle. So how does it work and what are projective structures? Right, we have the second order differential operator and uh, we can ask what are the solutions of the differential equation uh, where this differential operator kind of kills the function u. Of course, we probably cannot do it on the circle. We should do it locally, but let's solve it locally. So locally, there would be two linearly independent solutions, and we can choose those solutions to have a Ronskian equal to one, right? So two linearly independent solutions with Ronskian equal to one. Then uh, to those solutions, we can associate a local map, which maps a point X of the circle or of a small piece of a circle to an element of RP1, given by the ratio of the two solutions, U1 of X and U2 of X. So this would provide for us a local diffeomorphism from uh, some piece of a circle. Let me try to draw it. So here is our circle and I have a piece of the circle, one can say a chart. And on this chart, there is a local isomorphism to RP1. Then maybe on some other chart, on the next chart, I can choose uh, a different set of solutions and they would provide another map to RP1. And uh, let's say, let me call this thing by Z. And it's easy to see that the transformation between the two charts, right, would be a Möbius transformation acting on RP1. So, and uh, this provides for us a projective structure. So the projective structure is a local isomorphism uh, from our manifold, in this case, a circle uh, to RP, in this case, RP1, modular Möbius transformations. In fact, well, it's interesting to construct the, the, the map which goes back. It's also given by a more or less um, explicit formula, but uh, maybe we don't do it now. Instead, uh, let me tell you a little bit more things just in preparation of doing Hamiltonian geometry. So we also need the co-joint action, right? Let me hide this part of the slide. Let me only show you for now the quadrant action. So, uh, right, the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle would act on quadratic differentials, and you will have a quadrant action. It's easy to write a symbol or joint F acting on T. But then the question is, uh, what is it in practice? And the, the answer is sort of interesting and surprising. You already see it here. So that's the formula. So the first part of the formula maybe is not that surprising because uh, uh, right, T is a quadratic differential. F is a diffeomorphism. You move T using the diffeomorphism F. And because it's a quadratic differential, you multiply by F prime squared. So I would say uh, this is not very surprising. This is sort of interesting. It turns out you need to add uh, C over two times the Schwarzen derivative. 
So let me here recall two features of the Schwartz and derivative. First of all, you see we already had Möbius transformations on the previous slide. So the Schwartz and derivative vanishes on Möbius transformations. And maybe more importantly, the Schwartz and derivative has this uh, uh, composition property. Because of this composition property, uh, this formula defines an action, right? Because it's not obvious why would it be an action, but because of the composition property, it turns out to be an action. So um, now we are ready to say, we want to look at Hamiltonian actions of this uh, central extension of diffeomorphisms of the circle. Uh, we need to fix this uh, C, which is sometimes called the level. And the theory would be very different for C equals zero and C non equal to zero. We, we're gonna always assume that C is non-zero. In fact, then to simplify things, we can also put it equal to one if you want. But uh, so in this uh, Hamiltonian geometry, it is a nice, nicer picture with uh, non-zero C. So then, uh, uh, so we want to study Hamiltonian geometry for this action. I must say this theory in contrast to loop groups is in its infancy. We don't know much about it. Then later on, you can ask me what you really know, but main things that I want to present to you today are examples. And uh, the first family of examples that I want to talk about, this is something which is known for decades or studied, intensely studied for decades. And these are co-joint orbits of this action. In other words, the orbits of the action which you see here. So we consider second order differential operators. We have this action of diffeomorphisms on the set of differential operators and we want to look at the orbits. So this classification was uh, pioneered, discovered and rediscovered many times. Uh, here, I, uh, I want to show you a little bit, uh, some, a little bit of the classification. We now gonna spend some time on this slide. And here I uh, outline some uh, uh, names of the pioneers of the topic. Uh, so in the beginning, probably the first paper that I am aware of is Lazutkin Pankratova in the middle of seventies. And they didn't know anything about any quadrant orbits or Hamiltonian geometry they were studying deformations of Hill operators. And then already in the context that I'm describing, quadrant action, it was pioneered by Siegel and Kirillov. And then there was a long paper of Witten who looked at it uh, uh, from some physics viewpoint. And then uh, there are many, many other papers where people studied it uh, with various details. So here is, uh, here is a glimpse of the classification. So first of all, you can imagine orbits where you can start with a function T being a constant, right? You can start with a constant potential in your second order differential operator. And this is, uh, this is the horizontal line that, 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 that is here. So each point on this uh, black horizontal line is an orbit. So, um, so then just, just to introduce to, to the zoo, there are some special points on that line. So these are points C over two times square of an integer. So C over two, C over two times two square and so on, C over two times N square. So I, I have in mind those points. And at these points, the following thing happens. You see the space of orbits branches. There are those vertical lines and on the vertical lines also each point represents an orbit. And uh, so you already see that there is this branching. So the quotient space is not Hausdorff. And uh, just to add to it, there are those uh, small points near each uh, red, red dot. So these are also the orbits uh, and uh, the red dot is in the closure of those, uh, of those orbits. So then uh, there are the following, you see, I, uh, I also write other things there. So uh, first of all, you have a second order differential operator and the second order differential operator, right? If you take this pair of solutions, U1 and U2, you can go around the circle and you will get a monodromy matrix. So this monodromy matrix is a two by two matrix. 
which can be hyperbolic, elliptic, or parabolic. And here you see uh, on the horizontal line to the right of zero, this is elliptic, to the left of zero, this is hyperbolic. All those vertical lines, they are hyperbolic. The dots, which are separate, they are parabolic. And then the red dots, with the exception of zero, uh, those dots correspond to the trivial monodromy, monodromy equal to one. So then you can also think of stabilizers and let me only outline two of them. So the red dot C over two, that's a very special dot. Let me make it bigger. So that's the only orbit where the stabilizer is PSL2R. And this orbit is called Teichmüller orbit. So this is by far the most studied gadget. So I think more than half of the literature is devoted to it. That's because it plays a big role in other parts of mass. So uh, this is naturally embedded in the so-called universal Teichmüller space, which contains Teichmüller spaces for all genera. Now, uh, the other interesting observation, uh, so the points of the black line, so the normal points, which are not special, elliptic or hyperbolic, there the stabilizer is S1. And it will be important for us on the last slides. So uh, now the claim is, these are all examples of, uh, I will call them Hamiltonian Virasora spaces. So Virasora, so Hamiltonian spaces for the action of the center extension of diffeomorphisms. And uh, I'm not gonna give you much information about the two form, but there is a unique two form which makes those orbits into Virasora Hamiltonian spaces. So these are classical examples that people studied for decades. For different purposes. Now, uh, Anton, I think, uh, could, could you explain? So, uh, what what are the uh, some examples of, of these orbits? Uh, so they consist of of the So, so, yeah, so you, you take uh, you start. Let's say let's let's focus on this most important orbit. So we take uh, a second order differential operator, which is. Uh, uh, d over dx square. Let's say let's put c equal one, and then we add one half. So d over d dx two plus one half. So this is a second order differential operator on the circle, right? And now what we do, we apply the action of uh, diffeomorphisms, and the action of uh, diffeomorphisms is given by this formula. So we take f an arbitrary diffeomorphism. And uh, we built a lot of new potentials, right? So this will be uh, like a huge family of second order differential operators. And that will be our space, the space of those differential operators, which are on the orbit of uh, T equal to one half. So that, that will be our space. And that's actually the space where Schwartz and theory lives. Right, the theory that we saw in the beginning, which is supposed to be dual or equivalent to JT gravity on the disk. So Jan, is it was it more or less? Uh, well, you well. You in mind? Yeah, no, if if it's not satisfactory, tell me. Just no, no worries. Yeah, well, that. that I mean, so, 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 so what are, what are, the, so, so you were explaining this fat red dot. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. This is a fat red dot. Yeah, so, so uh, what are its elements? I mean, that's uh, the, so elements. the elements. The elements of the fat red dot, these are second order differential operators, d over dx square plus potential. And this potential, should be in the orbit of uh, one half. One half is a constant on the circle under this weird action of diffeomorphisms. So for, for instance, so, so the, just, I mean, mm -hmm. an example of, of, a, of a potential. Ooh, ooh. No, but I mean, you, you, take, uh, you take any, like say, basically you are saying, what is an example of a diffeomorphism of the circle? An example of a diffeomorphism of the circle would be something like this. F of X is equal to X 
Plus, for instance, I can add uh, some finite small Fourier series, right? If uh, Fn's uh, say, so I have a finite number of Fn's, they are all small, or I can have an infinite number of Fn's with some, uh, with some condition, uh, right? So as the F prime would always be positive, right? I, I, I want to have that. So mm -hmm. then I, I need to substitute it here. It's going to be a little bit horrible, but that's that's what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, yes. So 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 this this I this I understand. But uh, but uh, this, this is true for for any. Uh, uh, I mean, so, so what is special about the fat red dot? Uh, uh, oh, the special thing. Okay, there are many special things, but I would like to uh, to highlight this special thing. It turns out that if you if you use Möbius transformations, then one half is stable under those Möbius transformations. Right, each orbit of the action you can say what is the stabilizer. Right, what is the you 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 have an action. This action is transit, transitive of the diffeomorphisms, but then you you can ask what would be uh, uh, what are the uh, diffeomorphisms which don't change it. And here I'm saying that if you take uh, uh, f1 cos x plus f2 sine x plus uh, f3, so they would stabilize this one half. So that's uh, that's the idea here. I simplify things. I assume f1, f2, and f3 are small. But the very special thing about it, that's the unique orbit where the stabilizer is exactly PSL2R. There are no other orbits which are like that. If you move a little bit left or a little bit right, it's going to be S1. If you move down, it will be R. And if you move to those parabolic points, it will be also isomorphic yeah. to R. Yeah, uh, OK. Uh, is it easy to, to, to understand it? I mean, uh, is it easy to, to prove this? The, the, oh, the, it's, uh, let's say, easy depends on the definition of easy. It's elementary. It's a kind of the study of those uh, stabilizers. It's cumbersome. Uh, people, as I said, they wrote some relatively large number of papers, each of them presenting a method or for classifying stabilizers and finding good representatives. But it's it's all elementary. It's like uh, first year calculus. But mm -hmm. first year calculus do doesn't need to be very short, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, right. So now I want to tell you about something new. So remember, we started with JT gravity, and JT gravity had surfaces and hyperbolic metrics. Now, uh, so other so new examples are moduli spaces of hyperbolic metrics. Now let me introduce a little bit of machinery. So sigma bar will be a compact oriented closed surface. So the surface which includes the boundary. And again, to simplify things, let me say that the boundary is just S1. So there is just one boundary component. And now I introduce sigma to be the interior of this gadget. So sigma is the surface without boundary. It's an open surface. So now you will see why, why I need that. So our space M will be the space of hyperbolic metrics on sigma. So those solutions of JT early Lagrange equation. But then on those metrics, we impose the following condition. So let me near the boundary introduce a local coordinate system. So X will be a coordinate along the boundary and Y a boundary defining function. And I want the product of Y squared times G to be a local metric on the collar near the boundary of sigma bar. In other words, the metric, uh, the hyperbolic metric G explodes as one of a y square near the boundary. So that's how hyperbolic metrics typically like to behave at infinity. In fact, uh, here is an interesting thing about terminology. In mathematics, there is a whole theory about so-called hyperbolic ends. So what I draw here is a hyperbolic end. Uh, and uh, so in mathematics, they're called funnels. And physicists, when they recently found an interest in it, they introduced their own words. They call them trumpets. 
So because it resembles of some kind of trumpet, right? So uh, we now divide it by an action of a group. That's the group of diffeomorphisms of the closed surface. And here you can either take the connected component of diffeomorphisms, then the quotient will be some kind of infinite dimensional fresh manifold, or you can divide also by the mapping class group and then the action, then, then the quotient will be in some way more interesting topologically, but then it will have some or default singularities. But okay, it doesn't matter so much for us. And similar to what Mindrun and Woodward were doing 25 years ago, we say that the diffeomorphisms should restrict to one at the boundary. So I claim, or next uh, slide, you will see a theorem saying that these are very sort of Hamiltonian spaces. But let me already say that there is a natural action of diffeomorphisms of the circle. That's because uh, there is a natural action of all diffeomorphisms of sigma bar on this gadget. And uh, I'm here dividing by the group, which is a normal subgroup of all diffeomorphisms. So then uh, the quotient of our group of diffeomorphisms, but its normal subgroup naturally acts. And it turns out to be exactly the universal cover of diffeomorphisms of uh, S1. So we already have an action of the group, which is good. So now um, here is the main result that I want to present to you today. So uh, those moduli spaces are Verasor or Hamiltonian spaces. And um, I will probably show you the construction of the moment map. And I will probably skip the construction of the two form uh, because maybe it's a bit more involved and it's also somewhat less worked out. Uh, and instead, I will then finish with some interesting conjectures and open questions. So how does the moment map look like? Recall that the moment map should associate to a metric uh, a second order differential operator on the circle. So here is how it works. So uh, you can uh, cover the color by charts and hyperbolic geometry, the wisdom of hyperbolic geometry tells us that each of those charts is uh, um, isomorphic to a piece of uh, a hyperbolic plane. So you can always choose coordinates x, y on the uh, pink chart, x prime, y prime on the yellow chart, such that the metric would have a standard form. Now, uh, on the overlap between the charts, the isometry of the uh, hyperbolic plane, these are Merbus transformations, right? So the, there would be a Merbus transformation which is doing it. Now, as we saw, that's the same as a projective structure on, on S1, which is the boundary. And uh, I didn't show you the inverse formula, but I claim that the projective structure is the same as second order differential operators. So uh, you just reconstruct the second order differential operator, uh, which would be your moment map. In fact, uh, there, is, uh, there is an explicit formula for what is T in terms of the metric. Perhaps I would still show you that formula. Um, that's an interesting formula, a somewhat surprising formula inspired also by what people do in physics. So let's look at this color and let's consider the coordinates X and Y. And let's consider those Y equal to constant curves. Maybe these are physicists weekly boundaries. We don't really know. So, but there is a family of those curves. And what you can do, each of those curves has a geodesic curvature. Right, this geodesic curvature it depends on y because you're sitting on the curve, y equal to a constant, and it depends on x, which parameterizes the curve. So there is a following beautiful fact. It turns out that when y goes to zero, when you go to, the, to this boundary at infinity, the geodesic curvature of those curves tends to one. And the difference of kg minus one divided by y square, not by y, but by y square has a finite limit, which gives you a function on the boundary at infinity. So this is some, whatever, right? Hyperbolic geometry is, is full of miracles. And in particular, this is one of its miracles. 
So then also the metric near the boundary, right? It has many terms. And if I expand it into a Laurent series in Y, so then there will be such a term, A square times DX square or Y square. Necessarily, there will be many other terms. It turns out that uh, the concrete expression for, for this potential, for this Hill potential, is this combination of K and A. So those things you extract from the metric. And the surprising part or unexpected mysterious part, you can act by diffeomorphisms on the metric. The metric naturally transforms under diffeomorphisms. You can restrict your diffeomorphism to the boundary and you can apply this quadrant action with the Schwartz and derivative, this horrible formula. And uh, so this map from G to T is equivalent. So that's, uh, because the moment may have, remember, it needs to be equivalent. So this is part of my story. Okay. In principle, I would also need to tell you what is omega, but I suggest to skip it. And instead, let's look again at 2D, 1D duality. So what is our take at 2D, 1D duality? So we have two sets of examples. We have moduli of hyperbolic metrics. This is a kind of 2D story. And we have co-adjoint orbits. So this is a 1D story, right? It only needs a circle, nothing else. So here is um, a set of um, statements, or you can say conjectures. So we start with those which are like um, more or less 100% true. And then we descend to those which are uncertain, whatever needs to be worked out and so on. So first of all, there is more or less, let's say, we can interpret it in that way. The first statement that I showed to you, the duality in the JT theory of uh, Sarge, Schenker, and Stanford, our interpretation is that it claims that the moduli of hyperbolic metrics on a disk is isomorphic to this Teichmüller orbit, to the orbit of T uh, equal to BC over two. And well, formally, one still needs to write up a proof, but it's almost surely true because uh, both spaces, they are uh, Verisoro Hamiltonian spaces, and, the, uh, and they are isomorphic to diff plus S1 over PSL2R. And uh, the classification of the orbits tells you that there is only one such a space. So more or less, let's say, there's a little bit hand wave in the middle, which needs to be fixed. So this seems to be true. Now, what about other orbits? So here is uh, B is a statement which is very likely to be true. Also needs to, to needs a proof, but it's very likely to be true. So remember, uh, remember to the right of zero, there are, there are orbits called elliptic orbits. So if you forget red dots, there are those elliptic orbits. And um, those elliptic orbits, we believe, correspond to moduli where you consider hyperbolic matrix on a disk and you admit one conic singularity. A conic singularity is something which is characterized by the deficit or surplus of the angle at that point. So at that point, the angle, when you go around the conic singularity is not two pi. Let's call, let's say it is alpha. And then here is, uh, here is, you can say a conjecture or a guess that uh, there is again, you can say duality or equivalence that those uh, moduli of hyperbolic metrics, they are isomorphic to those elliptic orbits. Then the next statement, which is already less sure, suppose we take uh, the angle to be equal to two pi n this n bigger than one. So uh, the guess is that we would get those exceptional orbits. But here it's already clear that one needs to do something with the definition of the moduli spaces. So remember, we were saying that the moduli spaces, uh, they are defined modulo the action of some subgroup of the diffeomorphism group. And here there would be some transformations which move this red point from one place to the other. 
And those transformations are probably not diffeomorphisms. They have some kind of singularities. So you need to modify the equivalence relation to admit some kind of mild singularities. And um, to be honest, this is not worked out. This is highly probable, but, uh, but we don't quite know. Finally, uh, there are all those hyperbolic and uh, in principle also parabolic orbits. Uh, the natural guess would be that uh, there would be still uh, some, uh, some spaces of hyperbolic metrics with maybe more complicated, more intricate singularities. But, but this is an open question. Here, there is even no guess. We, we don't quite know whether this duality works. But of course, that would be a natural and attractive conjecture that there is a full duality. Uh, so there are always hyperbolic metrics uh, with some mild singularities. Uh, and then you can obtain all the 1D structures, so all, all the quadrant orbits. So that's, that, that's, that's one conjecture. So maybe I spent uh, the, the last two, three minutes uh, speculating a little bit about integration. Remember, I uh, outlined that in a good Hamiltonian theory, there should be many things. Among them, there are so-called Dustermatt-Heckman integrals. And uh, Dustermatt-Heckman integrals, this is what? You have uh, a Hamiltonian action. You have maybe isolated fixed points. And uh, then you can compute an integral uh, with the Liouville measure of the exponential of the moment map. So recall uh, the stabilizers of points on the vertical line, they all include S1, which is nice. It turns out that there is a unique S1 fixed point. And this led physicists, I think it was pioneered by Stanford and Witten, and then also by the paper that I already cited. So uh, they made a formal calculation of the pass integrals, assuming that the uh, that the dustermatt heckman formula works. You need to regularize some infinite dimensional function, but otherwise, uh, so you have one fixed point, so you have only one localization contribution. And just for your interest, I, uh, I wrote some answers here. You see, these are kind of uh, rather elementary functions, some, uh, some power, power law times the exponential function. So uh, here are some ideas about it. First of all, uh, maybe one can prove those formulas if one finds uh, global Darvu coordinates on the, uh, on the corresponding orbit. You know, if you have Darvu coordinates, then it turns out that your would-be pass integral is Gaussian. And Gaussian integrals, uh, well, I mean, we can negotiate with Gaussian integrals. In the case of hyperbolic orbits with constant t smaller than zero, uh, in a recent paper with Chekharis and humans, I proposed those coordinates. This is some kind of modification or whatever version of what people were looking at before. But you see, this is a very explicit transformation, which uh, may which provides global uh, Darbu coordinates. So then the integrals become Gaussian. And we can more or less confirm those forms. Uh, could you recall, uh, Anton, what is T zero? T or whatever. This is uh, this is uh, the value. So sorry, this is the value of this T of x. We look at the orbit which passes through a constant. Let's call that constant T zero. So this is something which characterizes the orbit. Like before, we, we looked at the orbit where T0 was one half. Remember, we had a discussion of the big red point, and there T0 is one half, or C over two, if C is not one. Is not one. OK, uh, oh. okay so, so it is it's just a distinguished value. Uh, yeah, it just, just uh, so for, for T constant and negative, we kind of know what to do. Now, here is my last slide. It turns out that in finite dimensional Hamiltonian geometry, there is a theorem by Karshon and Tolman, which says the following. Suppose you have only one S1 fixed point, and suppose that this S1 fixed point realizes a maximum or a minimum of the moment map. 
that's how 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 it is here on the uh, on this uh, on this drawing, right? So then they claim there is a global Darbu chart. Of course, it's all finite dimensional, but one can still wonder. So those uh, orbits, including t equal to c over two, the big red dot, and the orbits to the left of big red dot. So they all have just one fixed point, and this fixed point, depending on how you make choices, it's either a minimum or a maximum of the moment map. And the question is, uh, do they possess a global Darbu chart? And whether in this case, one can justify the just mathematical calculation of Stanford and Witten and prove the formula using a Gaussian integral. Well, as far as I know, this is, this is not known. Up to now, all the attempts failed, but well, let's hope, let's hope in the future they will be more fruitful. Well, that was my last slide. Thank you for your patience. And uh, I apologize for being a little bit over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton, for this uh, very beautiful talk. And I now uh, leave the floor to the audience for questions. So actually, I think uh, maybe I can start have a, a rather maybe naive question. So, but in, in the physics, uh, I mean, in the, in the physics literature, how is this, du this duality detected? I mean, between the 2D theory and the 1D theory, how do they formulate it? Let's say maybe, I, I don't know, uh, if, if, uh, if you want an honest answer, I don't really understand it in detail. Uh, a less detailed answer, uh, maybe if you go back, if you go back here, you see, so the, uh, the JT theory has uh, a constraint, right? Phi mm -hmm. creates for you a constraint. Then you can try to solve uh, your hyperbolic metric equations in the bulk and try to reduce everything to the boundary terms. Mm -hmm. So then they argue that they have some good choice of boundary terms. And with this good choice of boundary terms, uh, that's what you get. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but you see, maybe, but the, the problem is maybe because I don't understand it, maybe uh, maybe I don't give justice. Uh, kind of what I say sounds like, okay, they do something and they, they want the answer, they get the answer. So, but, but I, I, I don't know in, in the sense that maybe I don't fully understand the arguments. Mm -hmm. This was partly the motivation why we wanted to look at it from a more mathematical perspective. And as you can see, we don't make any choices. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's maybe for us some, some feature, but maybe, maybe they would say, oh, but that's obvious what you're saying. Of course, there are no choices. Only those boundary terms make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, like, that, that, that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to give you an answer because it might be that I uh, that my answer is too critical, and that's because of my personal lack of understanding. Okay, thank uh, you. I, yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, questions? Other questions from the audience? Uh, may I ask you about this gravity? This uh, Jackie. Uh, Tidal mm -hmm. bone gravity. I mean, the, the Lagrangian does not resemble any Lagrangian that I have ever seen. The, it has no uh, no okay. kinetic. I mean, it uh, does not resemble uh, Lagrangian of a field theory or of of or Einstein uh, Einstein Hilbert. So well, it's... I mean, here I let's say again, probably my answer is going to be unsatisfactory. But uh, as you know, the Einstein Hilbert action in 2D would be trivial, right? Because uh, it would be a total derivative, you can say, or it would compute some, uh, some churn class or early characteristics. So that's why from the very beginning, right? People invented different types of 2D gravity. Maybe the 2D gravity that we all are more familiar with is the uh, Polakov gravity, right? Where you, where you write 
RG, one of Laplace and RG, right? That's one of the popular 2D gravities. But then there is a big movement also of so-called dilaton gravities. And uh, the Jakif title poem is uh, maybe the most known or one of the gravities of that theory. But there, of course, you see, you need, you need an extra field. And uh, that's, uh, that's one of the very popular, or it was one of the very popular models. Maybe one should also say that long ago, Strober uh, and Schaller, they were studying that model and they invented something that you might have heard about, which is called Poisson Sigma models, starting from this very theory. So this is one of the examples of a Poisson Sigma model. And then the like, Poisson Sigma model was used to quantize Poisson manifolds. So in principle, that's something which exists even in the gravity literature. I think trouble with collaborators at some point also long, long ago, he classified solutions, various like tricky universes of this Jakif title one gravity, which is uh, an interesting story. You can whatever introduce some black holes there, look at horizons. So in principle, it, it is some toy gravity model. Then I'm not very much equipped to argue how useful or how interesting it is. Now it seems to be related to many things. Such Schenker and Stanford, they related to the uh, uh, SYK models in, uh, in condensed matter, and they related to analysis of matrix models and to, in mathematics to computation and Mirzakani volumes because it's related to hyperbolic geometry. So probably its existence is justified in some way. So it's a good model, but a model of what? That's of course, yeah. To what extent it's a model of gravity? Yeah, here again, I'm not equipped to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Well, thank you, people. Thank so you for your attention. Doesn't seem to be the case. So thanks a lot, Anton, again, for the beautiful talk and for the very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.